I welcome you all in the third edition of uh, Partition Lecture Series 2022. The lecture series is being uh, organized jointly by the Center for Diaspora Studies, Punjab mm -hmm. University, and the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Khadakpur. The title of today's discussion is Women's Writing on Partition. And uh, to participate in the discussion, we have with us Dr. Sakoon Singh, Professor Nandi Bhatia, and Professor Prabhjot Kumar. Parma, sorry. I welcome Dr. Sukun Singh Ji, Professor Nandi Bhatia Ji, Professor Prabhjot Parmar Ji. I also welcome Professor Arvind, Vice Chancellor, Punjabi University, Professor Anjali Gera Roy from IIT Khadakpur, Professor Gurmukh Singh, Director, Center for Diaspora Studies, Punjabi University, and all our listeners. Now I would request Professor Anjali Gera Roy Ji to briefly introduce the partition lecture series and formally welcome all our esteemed guests. Professor Anjali Gera Roy Ji. Good evening to all of those who are joining us in India and good morning to our guests from Canada. Uh, we begin the partition lecture series 2022. This is the third part of the series, which we are jointly hosting with Punjabi University Patiala uh, with a panel discussion by three eminent uh, speakers, a novelist and two academics, all three of whom have uh, made a significant contribution to women's writing on partition. Dr. Sapun Singh has a novel where she, which, which deals partially with partition and Dr. Nandi Bhatia, Professor Nandi Bhatia and Professor, Professor Prabhjot Pradmar have published vastly in this area. Professor Nandi Bhatia is soon uh, going to come out with a book on women's writing on partition. And Professor pa Prabhjot Parmar has already published a lot of essays on women's writing on partition. So I thought that we've had in the last two series, we've had a number of very distinguished historians, sociologists, political scientists, and literary scholars speaking about partition. We've had uh, the series running since August 20, uh, 2020. In August 2021, we began the series in collaboration with Punjabi University Patyal. Uh, the first, uh, the 2020 series was uh, started by Professor Ishtia Kemmer of Lund uh, of, uh, from Sweden. And uh, the second series we began with Professor Ian Talbot, the 2021 series. And this time I think there was nothing better than starting it with this panel, because uh, even though I'm a literary scholar, we have not had many panels on literary studies. So Dr. Dharmchit, Dr. Gurmuk, who all of us who work in literary studies, we are very excited about beginning the 2022 series with a panel on literary representations of partition. And we are delighted that we have a young novelist, Dr. Sakun Singh, who has published a novel, which I thoroughly enjoyed reading, which has partially deals with partition, not all of it, but it has a large part which deals with partition. And Professor Nandi Bhatia and Professor Prabhjot Parmar, who have either books in print or they have already published on women's writing on partition. So this promises to be a very exciting uh, session. But before I introduce the speakers, I think we would like uh, Professor Arvind. We always say that it is the persistence which is most important. So one has to persist on a theme. Uh, and we have persisted on this theme from last year and uh, in collaboration with IIT Khadakpur, who have been looking at it uh, from an even earlier time. So first of all, uh, that's extremely important. And I congratulate Diaspora Center for persisting on the partition theme and coming back to it. Uh, secondly, literature in some sense, uh, you know, there are layers of uh, uh, social memories and some things, politics happens at a very short time scale and is a very direct, direct expression. So literature is one step back 
where things filter and more subtler things come out. And people say music is even one more step uh, further. Uh, things get codified over longer time scales in music. So I think it's important that we look at uh, literary aspects of partition. And therefore, today's program and this series we are starting is extremely important. Uh, in the past couple of weeks, I've been looking at my father's uh, uh, cupboard and I found uh, notes written in 1947-1948, just after the partition when uh, his, he and his family came from the other side and how he was struggling as a student in Amritsar. Uh, and he describes in one of his diaries, he said he had nothing else other than the clothes he was wearing and a hockey stick somehow which was with him. And there was nothing, there are no other positions that he had at that time. And that kind of a phase people had to go through. Uh, of course, there's a lot more to it. And it has uh, filtered through decades in the literature. But as I said, in the on the earlier occasion, uh, we have kind of avoided engaging with many aspects of partition. And that is also, uh, that also reflects in the literature on partition. How deep have we gone? into analyzing it, how direct we have become in terms of facing some of the realities. And I, as I always say, that perpetuators of violence remained in our society. Many of them remained in prominent positions and we were not able to challenge their authority uh, over the decades after partition. Now this also will, I think, reflect in literature in, in, in many ways. And I look forward to that kind of a subtler expression and kind of a realization that perpetuation, perpetuators of violence on both sides, on any communities, were as much as much at wrong as any perpetuator of violence. So understanding of that variety uh, is emerging. And uh, in literature also, it's somewhat underrepresented, but I think it will find that representation. So with these words, uh, I'm really thankful to IIT Khadakpur to persist on this collaboration. And I think we have a long way to go. Uh, I would like uh, partition series to culminate in certain documentation, either a book or a monograph or set of uh, essays, which would be compiled as an edited volume jointly by Punjabi University and IIT Kharagpur, where all the discussions, presentations, and so on are put in a formal form. So with these words, I welcome all the guests and I look forward to participation in the program to whatever extent I can. But as usual, the Diaspora Central programs are recorded. So even if I have to go here and there, this partition series, I'm specifically following myself very much personally. And uh, I want uh, a, a serious academic outcome to come out of this. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Arvind. It's not every day that we get a vice chancellor to join our series. And we are delighted and privileged that you've taken the trouble to join us and to be with us throughout the program, through all these series. I have the pleasure of introducing the speakers now briefly. The first speaker is Dr. Sakul Singh, who studied English literature at the JNU New Delhi and Punjab, a Punjabi University, Chandigarh. She's been a, a recipient of the Fulbright Fellowship and currently teaches Indian literature and cultural studies in Chandigarh. She's published her academic writings extensively, including a uh, contribution in several uh, journals, but her, uh, she's also served on the editorial uh, board of team of several journals and edited a special South Asia section for a review of books in the University of Texas at Austin. She was involved in the selection process of, uh, sorry, just a minute. Yeah, of Bal Prakashan Sahitya Academy, New Delhi 2021. She is currently doing a stint at the Indian Institute of Advanced Study, Shimla. But today she is here with us as an author, as the author of the novel In the Land of Lovers, which was shortlisted for the PFC uh, 
a, a, its debut novel. And it's, I was uh, delighted to see that it figured in the 75 books which one should read on partition. So that's our first speaker. And our ne uh, next speaker is Professor Nandi Bhatia. The second speaker uh, in today's talk is Professor Nandi Bhatia. Professor Nandi Bhatia needs no introduction to those who work in literary studies. She is a professor in the Department of English at the University of Western Ontario in Canada and is currently the Associate Dean of Research in the Faculty of Arts and Humanities. Her research interests include colonial and post-colonial literature, the 1947 partition of India, diasporic literature, theater, and British India. She is the author of Acts of Authority, Stroke Acts of Resistance, Theater and Politics in Col Colonial and Postcolonial India, for which she won an award, Performing Women, Stroke Performing Womanhood, Theater, Politics and Dissent in North in India, published by OUP again, and co-editor, uh, we have co-edited this book, Partition Lives, Narratives of Home, Displacement, and Resettlement, which was published in 2008. And we have another coming, which is again our co-edited effort, which will be out. At present, Nandi is working on a Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada funded project on female performance in India. Her monograph, uh, Women's Stories of Partition, is forthcoming with Rutledge. For her research, she was awarded the John, uh, John Charles Polony Award Prize for Literature and was named UWA Faculty Scholar. Now we have the third speaker, Dr. Prabhjot Parparmar. Prabhjot Parmar is an uh, Associate Professor of English at University of the Fraser Valley in Abbotsford, Canada. She is a co-editor of When Your Voice Stays Like Home, Immigrant Women Write, and has published articles on partition, dementia and music, Bollywood, and history of Punjabi cinema. Her research and teaching interests include post-colonial literature, with a focus on South Asian literature and cinema partition and Indian soldiers in World War I. Through these, her work is strongly linked with community work, anti-racism, anti-colonial and decolonial narrative, indigenization, migration, violence against women and social justice. So we begin with the first round of the panel discussion. And I request Dr. Sakun Singh to speak uh, for about 10 minutes. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Roy, Dr. Arvind, Professor Gurmuk Singh, Dr. Dharamjeet, Professor Nandi Bhatia, Professor Prabhjot Ramar. What a delight to be here and what an honor. I'll just pick on uh, uh, one phrase that uh, Professor uh, Arvind used, you know, his use of persistence of a theme. And I think that quite explains my point of departure with my novel. Uh, it was essentially a persistence of a theme of uh, the family lore that one was exposed to and just uh, trying to extend it further. Because around 2017, up until then, you know, I was quite a bit into academic writing. But around 2017, this thing about, uh, uh, you know, this uh, novel with the protagonist who was a bit like me was making itself, uh, you know, uh, th th this whole uh, desperation for it to uh, come to life uh, around the year 2017 which is when I thought that I needed to take a break from uh, academic work. And for about a year, I took off from work and uh, uh, you know, sat down with it to uh, give it life. And essentially, that was the point of departure, this persistence of a theme. And if there was you know, uh, this uh, uh, job before me to provide a certain subjectivity to this character, which was making itself known, 
which I felt I somewhere connected to. And I think uh, your first novels are uh, more personal, I feel. Uh, somewhere, you know, one is trying to dig into a uh, personal experience. Uh, this is an oft repeated question. I'm asked if uh, it's autobiographical, if the protagonist Nanki is drawn out to you, uh, which, uh, you know, I would say that there's no black and white answer to that. It is not autobiographical in a very black and white way, but I think one can only write uh, and write convincingly about experiences that are close to you know, oneself. So somewhere I was digging into my own experience and somewhere this urge was there to create a character uh, that stood uh, in a certain very rooted context out of which one was coming. And also somewhere this disappointment uh, or this uh, desperation to hold on to a value system, which one felt was getting eroded. And I think that was the year 2017. I felt I needed to uh, write down uh, you know, the value systems that one had saw and felt and grown up with. And somewhere the whole uh, way of life was getting eroded. One, of course, was the political change. The other, of course, was uh, with the stepping in of internet. Uh, I think the kind of upheaval that has brought into many lives in the sense that uh, now the influences are many, many and much, much more and in ways that uh, are hard for us to even deal with. So uh, to a certain extent, uh, uh, the kind of, uh, you know, a more limited, a more narrower, but at the same time, a more specific milieu in which one grew up. I felt, you know, that was by and by, by and by getting lost. And somewhere there was this urgency to put that down and to create a woman character who perhaps was close to, you know, perhaps the way we thought and the way we reacted and the way, you know, the kind of value system that we grew up with. So that was the idea. And also the idea that uh, it was to be a kind of a, uh, uh, coming of age story, a kind of a buildings roman where uh, this woman is trying to find a place under the sun. And this whole idea about her proximity with the grandparents, because if I were to construct the subjectivity of this character, one of the most fundamental things was, uh, and like it, it is for our generation, is uh, a connection with the narratives of partition you know, from the grandparents' side in a more direct way and from, from the parents' side in a more borrowed way. We are the third generation, but somewhere uh, these narratives very much, uh, uh, you know, made uh, our subjectivity into what it was. I felt that that was really, you know, the, the point of departure from where I could start and begin constructing, you know, Nanki's subjectivity. Uh, my professor here, Professor Pushpinder Syal, who's one of the first readers, uh, she remarked, you know, after she did a reading of the novel, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a funny way, she said uh, that uh, you strategized this intimacy with the grandparents to an extent that you knocked off an entire generation. Because uh, hey, Nanki's parents are really in the shadows because she's lost her parents. She's, she's an orphan, so to say, and brought up by her grandparents in Chandigarh. So that connect with the grandparents is more uh, intimate and more direct. And her exposure to those stories uh, is very, very direct and on a daily basis. And I wanted to establish that intimacy of the third generation with the partition stories. Uh, and one of the things that bothered me uh, was you know my own experience with teaching partition narratives in the classroom as well because uh, uh, you know for the longest time we had the shadow lines by professor by amitav ghosh and i saw somewhere along the line that there was a difference in terms of reception to that text you know somewhere along the line i felt that the response from the students were getting more watered down uh, you know especially when it came to partition so that kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of put this responsibility on me, uh, you know, from a, a particular milieu 
from a particular generation to bring these stories to life, to bring these experiences and these narratives that one had heard in some form. Uh, and I felt that even though academic writing had been my material for such a long time, now I needed to, uh, you know, put it down in the form of fiction. And there is just so much more that uh, one can achieve with fiction and a much more subtle way. So uh, it kind of started making itself uh, more real around the year 2017. But of course, you know, the novel came out in 2020. I would say it took me about a year uh, to write it. Uh, and uh, that was possible because I took off work. Now, uh, talking of, uh, you know, the portrayal of partition, let me just revolve it around uh, Nanki's characterization, because she's the third generation, uh, you know, recipient of these narratives. And I felt that really is my point of view also. That really is the, my stance also. That is the protagonist's stance. And uh, like I said, one of course is uh, her proximity with the grandparents and the stories that she hears at a daily basis. Uh, the response to that, that Nanki has, that perhaps was my response also to some of these uh, narratives of partition that, that I would hear from my grandfather, who was otherwise quite a daunting figure. But when it came to talking about his own experience of partition, how he would go into those details of that particular day when he uh, you know arrived at that station and took that train uh, I saw a very different side to my grandfather in those evenings so somewhere I wanted to uh, recreate that and then I used the device of uh, uh, flashback where uh, the narrative shifts to 1947 but before I do that Nanki's own response uh, is uh, not so much of sentimentality, which is, I feel, the usual Punjabi response. It's more of this uh, feeling of, uh, you know, this, this absurdity with the idea of partition. You know, she can sense this absurdity and, uh, you know, she, uh, you know, that is the way she connects with this experience of partition. It's, it's more absurd for her. So then it, uh, the narrative shifts back to 1947 and, uh, you know, this uh, uh, entire story of her great grandparents where uh, his, her great grandfather Gurbaz Singh is killed in broad daylight. And uh, what is peculiar uh, you know, about this portrayal, uh, which I sense because it is from a woman's perspective, is how these two women are hiding in uh, what is known as a, you know, the Turiwala Kamra, you know, where they have the fodder. It is the fodder room, which is typically a dark space. And you have these uh, mother and daughters hiding in there and witnessing this turn of events where the father is uh, confronted with this mob and eventually it leads to his death. The mother and the uh, you know daughter. The daughter is pregnant and she's visiting her parents' home, which is where you know this uh, whole uh, incidence of uh, the father getting killed happens, and how these two women then escape. Up until now, the great grandmother, who I call Manji, is quite in control and command. So uh, she takes the initiative. Once the husband is dead, both the women go around. Uh, you know, conducting his cremation and got gone into the details of how the, how these two women go around doing that and uh, their journey from this side to that, that side, which is uh, on foot. Uh, it's also about what they witness while they journey on foot. And that entire episode is really in first person where uh, it's a kind of, a, uh, you know, a, a dispassionate kind of a commentary on what these two women witness without bringing in sentimentality. But because there is lack of sentimentality and it's first person and it's just a reportage, it's they're just uh, reporting as they're seeing what they're seeing. You know, the layers of irony become more apparent uh, in, in the sense of, uh, uh, you know, this uh, idea of midnight speech going on at one level and this idea of utter displacement going on at, at another level and uh, how these two women deal with it. 
but once they come back to the site uh, where the son-in-law is an army officer, so they are slightly better placed. And uh, it's not long before they find a refuge and uh, the son-in-law takes them to the army cantonment where they are put up in, you know, colonial bungalow. Uh, so uh, the mother tags along with the married daughter. It's the son-in-law and the married daughter and uh, she tags along with them. Uh, it's then, you know, her whole cultural conditioning which becomes problematic. It's how women put themselves in different roles. Here it's the role of a mother-in-law and how uh, she thinks that it's really not appropriate for her to be living in a married daughter's home. And all along, there is this hope that she would return, which is something that uh, I think which is true of many, many people. They thought that they are going to return home. So she nurses this hope somewhere from this utter strength that she shows in dealing with the cremation to then this hope that she nurtures of one day returning to Okara. Uh, and then this resentment, because before long, the son-in-law and daughter fall into a pattern and a new life takes over. And the daughter is like this Mame Sahab, she's an army wife. So she starts attending parties. So whereas she has to be kind of uh, uh, very, uh, uh, you know, uh, in a way, a well-behaved mother-in-law with the son-in-law. But as far as the daughter is concerned, she nurses this resentment against the daughter that the daughter has given up on this idea of going back to their village. So by and by from that resentment, uh, she begins to lose her mind. And I think the thing about uh, this novel is how it you know, becomes uh, a narrative uh, or, or, or uh, you know, this... Uh, uh, how it all plays out in a psychic space of a woman, of a particular generation. And uh, this idea really uh, somewhere also lies in my own experience of my great grandmother, whose you know, portrait we would see. I had never met her, but my mother would talk of some kind of a PTSD. Uh, this woman looked very serene with a white dupatta and a blue salwar kameez. Uh, but, you know, my mother told me stories of her trauma and what she had undergone. She witnessed the murder of her own husband and how the war of 1962, the Indochina war, kind of uh, triggered all that trauma and would trigger it again and again. So somewhere, Maji's character, the great-grandmother's character, I would say the seed of that character is somewhere in my own great-grandmother. But of course, it's fictionalized to a great extent. So again, you know, I would say it's not, uh, uh, there is no one-on-one -on -one, uh, autobiographical correspondence. And then later, one or two points I'll make. How much more time do I have? I'm sorry, I lost track of time. You will have more time in the second round. If right. you can quickly conclude now, just then you can continue on the second round. Yes. Okay, so I'll just make two quick points. You know, just continuing the strand is then again Nanki's uh, whole relationship with her grandparents. And one of the things that I want to highlight is the connection with the Urdu language and how by and by, you know, we see an erosion of that whole culture and, you know, all this, uh, you, you know, subcultural parts that go with the idea of Urdu and how uh, by and by, you know, it, those are just black marks on paper for her generation, like it was for me. You know, that is the connection with Urdu that our generation had. But then the kind of connection that the grandfather had with Urdu was a very different story. But how it, you know, increasingly becomes irrelevant, uh, which I've tried to show through, uh, you know, the Urdu newspaper and the kind of imagery and images it carries and how, you know, the whole subculture becomes and the language becomes irrelevant. So I think I'll stop here. <laughs> uh, just an overview and tying up of threads, uh, you know, the idea of partition and really putting Nanki in the center, because I think that is the vantage point of this novel, which is, you know, third generation view of the partition. Thanks, Sukur. We'll have more time to listen to you. But now I would request Professor Nandi Bhatia uh, to have her say, 10 minutes to you, Nandi. Okay. If you can wrap up in 10 minutes and then we'll have Prabhu then the second round. Okay. Thanks, Anjali. So before I start, I just 
<clears throat> want to say that it's my privilege to be part of this, uh, to be invited to be part of this panel. And, uh, you know, thanks to Anjali uh, for organizing this and to Patiala University and Dr. Arvind and Sakun. It's a pleasure to uh, hear you. I also want to say I too grew up on stories about the partition from my dad, uh, you know, endless stories from grandmothers and aunts and uh, family friends. And what I did realize was that uh, they never, they didn't want uh, stories to be recorded, you know, so that maybe, I don't know, I will always try to figure that out. Maybe they didn't want them to be fixed in a frame. So um, when I was reading literary stories, I realized how similar this, many of the stories are. You know, if Sakun, you're talking about Urdu, for example. Yeah, that was the language of our parents, my parents, they just wrote to each other in Urdu and uh, something we uh, were not, we had to make an effort to learn on our own. So that is what brought me to uh, literature and, you know, my own, uh, uh, the value that literature carries for me in understanding partition for all of us, uh, because because not any, not everybody uh, is in a position to articulate or would like to articulate. And I know there's, there are whole uh, memory projects going on, but uh, I think there is something important to be said about literature, literature as well. So I'm going to speak about women's literature from India and diaspora context. Because while most, um, I mean, one is that uh, I've already mentioned that literature itself is important, but also, um, while most writing or analysis speaks to partitions, trauma, women's stories also tell us about friendships, about love and solidarities amongst and across communities. So the literary turn in partition scholarship has, has uh, led to new insights, especially through the animation of stories as memorials and records of ordinary lives that supplement, complement, and interrupt the high politics of partition. <clears throat> Yet as Kamla has seen in Ritu Men and Assert, partition fiction has been a far richer source, not only because it provides popular and a stringent commentary on the politics of partition, but because here and there, we also find women's voices speaking for themselves. So what do the women's voices tell us? With attention to fiction by women, Anita Badami's Can You Hear the Nightbird Poem, Isma Chukta's short story Roots, and Anushri Roy's Letters to My Grandma, my presentation examines the importance of reading literary texts as sites that enable new and nuanced understandings of what Purushi Vitalia calls legacies of friendship. What one also learns from literary storytelling are insights about notions of belonging that are based not on religious affiliation alone, but through attachments to neighbors, friends, and families, and people to signal the time of community wants as the desired goal. So the friendships are enabled through cultural spaces, rather than the public domain of politics. In this literary images of food, restaurants, maps, letters, families, marriages, and memories take center stage. So that's, you know, that's why literature becomes so important. My first example is Isma Chukdai's Roots, or Journey, from a collection titled Quit India and Other Stories. Written in 1952 at a time when tensions related to partition had not yet subsided, and was still right in the border city of Amritsar, which led to the temporary closure of the Vaga border, Roots recollects the deeply intertwined lives of two families with adjacent homes, the narrator's Muslim family, who is preparing to leave for Pakistan, and Roop Chanji's Hindu family, who was the narrator's physical uh, family physician and Abba's oldest friend. In the early part of the story, the two families are completely integrated and comfortable in engaging in debates aligned with different political parties. Chuktai unpacks the friendships, the free movement of family members between the two households, exchange of meals and dishes, and the arrival of Dr. Saab or Rup Chanji as soon as he hears of Amma's illness. She even tells us about how after the death of Abba, Rup Chanji assumed a sense of responsibility towards our family and became the father figure, taking care of children's school fees, jewelry for the girls' dowries, resolving family disputes and advising about the additions of rooms to the home. The porousness of the two homes and the ease with which characters traverse these spaces and rooms shows the reader the coexistence and harmony that exists between the two households. With escalating tensions, the sons de decide to leave for Pakistan. Amma refuses to go and when the family decides to leave without Amma, 
and the moment arrives when the caravans and lorries and the police supervision begin to depart, it breaks Amma's heart into a million pieces. After the family's departure, Amma left alone, looks about the house, at the room where she first entered as a bride, at another room where his children were born, brought forth from the womb which they all, had all abandoned today. In addition to the pain and fear after Amma's children leave, Chuktai captures the loneliness and betrayal she feels. He says, who knows how many disturbing thoughts finding her alone fell upon her all night without warning. While desperately lost in her thoughts, Amma is taken aback by the pounding on the door that was getting louder. She hears the voices of her older sons and watches as the daughters-in-law holding the babies bring the whole house to life. As we learn, Rupchanji had followed the family to the railway station and persuaded Amma's sons all the way back from the colony junction. The story here addresses the meaning of belonging to the unbreakable bonds of loyalty between the two families, especially through Amma, who refuses to leave her home. Now, my next example is Anita Badami's Can You Hear the Nightbird Call? Set in Vancouver, it weaves the story of the 1985 Air India tragedy through the intertwined lives of three women and their migrations within India and between India and Canada. She evokes the partition through Sharanji or Viviji whose memories of Punjab after migrating to Canada in 1923 are beset with the loss of the family during the partition riots. Because of these losses, BBG has no home to return to in India. She claims Canada as a home, characterized by the Taj Mahal, the house that her husband Paji buys for her, and the Delhi Junction, the restaurant that she sets up in Vancouver, which becomes a hub for the convergence of South Asian communities. Through a sucky yet powerful description, Vadami illustrates how community ties emerge stronger than the post-partition tensions structured by partition, which play out at the Delhi Junction. So I'm going to read a passage from Vadami's novel. In 1965, when war broke out between India and Pakistan, the battle came to the Delhi Junction as well. The seating maps altered, and Hafiz and Ali Bai moved defensively over to a separate table across the room from the Indian group. The floor between them turned into the line of control, an unseen barrier of barbed wire stretching across it. Anger, hurt, and loss simmered on both sides. As the war across the world went on and casualties mounted on both sides, conversation between the two factions in the junction ceased altogether. <clears throat> and when Paji began to locally support the Indian side, Hafiz and Ali Bhai stopped coming to the capital. But when the war ended a few months later, they reappeared as if nothing had occurred. A good meal with familiar spices in a foreign country meant more than the enmities generated by distant homelands. So in this description, Badami creatively explores how diasporic communities navigate their identities and friendships around food, the theme of food. So we see that the restaurant and food culture become important sites for community interactions where ten political tensions play out and are subsequently resolved. And when concerns about the potential breakup of the Punjab yet again, that is in post-1984, emerge, they are counteracted by the following rejoinder. Again, I'm quoting here. It was maps that caused countries to exist and expire. Maps caused bitter wars. Maps erased people and landscapes just as efficiently as they created them. This reference to maps gestures towards the altered landscape of South Asia, then Cyril Radcliffe redrew the subcontinental boundaries in barely 40 days. But BBG challenges the idea of borders by drawing attention to her home and mission. Why should we concern ourselves with such matters? She asks, we are Canadians now. I don't like the idea of more partition and separation, more fiddling with borders. So she expands the definition of a Canadian home when she tells her friend Leela Bhatt that inside her home, it will always be Punjab, with its delicious and familiar smells of cumin and coriander and cardamom, and the tantalizing aromas of a parathas. Within this home, she nurtures the memories of pre-partition Punjab through the last letter from her sister Kamar, dated February 11, 1947, which she had read so often it was beginning to fall apart. The letter reminds Viviji that a few months later, in August, the British had left the Indian subcontinent. Punjab had been divided between two nations. And her family and her home in Punjab had disappeared. 
Haunted by this letter and the news of Tomer's disappearance, BBG finds solace in her home in Vancouver. Now, my last example is Anushri Roy's play, Letters to My Grandma, which was per first performed in Toronto in 2009. Set during the pre- and post-World War II period in Calcutta and in contemporary Toronto, the play unravels the drama of partition by foregrounding Malubi's discovery of her grandma's survival during the partition through grandma's letters, who is in a nursing home in Calcutta. When Malubi reads the letters, she finds them resonating with her own struggles as she negotiates her multiple identities in Toronto. As a colored immigrant, a dutiful daughter who must listen to her family, and a woman who wants to marry Mark, an immigrant from Pakistan residing in Toronto, despite her grandma's disapproval. This marriage plot foregrounds the ongoing communal outcomes that come alive for the audience through Malibu's phone conversations with grandma. Instead of judging grandma for a prejudiced attitude, Malibu attempts to understand the meanings and source of a prejudice. And while the play shows how partition altered community relations, it ends with Malibu receiving grandma's blessings before she dies, symbolized by the gold bangles, grandma needs for her. The multi-generational cast of characters in the play also highlights how different generations of women remember partition and reveals the shift from direct memories to what Marian Hirsch calls post memories that Malibu experiences through conversations and communication with her grandma. In this play, grandma's letters become important artifacts for preserving stories of survival that we may otherwise not know. So in conclusion, I would like to say that critical analysis of, of the 1947 partition of India focuses primarily on the trauma, devastation, and loss experienced and witnessed by ordinary people and continues to be centered largely on works by male writers and a few male writers. Yet women's narratives are important because, as Jasbir Jain says, they carve, a, I'm quoting uh, Jain here, they carve a subject through, through memory, perception, recall, and ring structures. Therefore, we must insist on the need to examine the expansive range of feminist positions to understand the differentiated articulations of women's relationship to the nation and also in you know, the community. The stories by Badami, Chuktai, and Roy exemplify a corpus of literary texts that strives to forge alliances across class, communities, and racial groups through everyday cultural spaces in the face of partition loss and fragmentation in India and its diaspora. Thank you. Thank you, Nandi. I can already see a preview of your book. Okay. <laughs> Looking forward to the book when it out. Uh, we'll talk more later about a number of things which you spoke. I'll take them up later in the second round. But let's first listen to Prabhjot, Dr. Prabhjot Parmar uh, in the first round. We, Dr. Prabhjot Parmar, we request you to speak for about 10 minutes before we begin the second round of discussion. Thanks, Anjali. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this panel. Uh, really excited to listen to uh, both Sakoon and uh, Nandi and looking forward to a conversation. And especially in an intimate group, it is even better at times. So formally, I would like to thank Vice Chancellor Arvindji, um, IIT Khadekpur, uh, Anjali Roy, of course, then uh, Dharamjit uh, Singh, of and, uh, and uh, Gurmukh Singh ji uh, for um, organizing uh, this event and including me in this panel. I, I will be uh, frank in saying that uh, there was so much related to partition in my mind that to contain it in 10 minutes, it's not a difficult task. Uh, I have done that in past and very well so and stayed within time limit too. Nevertheless, to think that I'm talking about partition and talking about 10 minutes, um, then what to include and what not to, uh, not to include. So uh, one of the poems that I had read, there was a line, someone somewhere drew a line. So that, that came to my mind among so many other things. So I just latched onto it because I had already missed the deadline to send, 
steps and the title for the talk. So that's what I'm focusing on this line. And through that line, I will just go here and there, literature and uh, outside of literature in real life. So uh, it has been mentioned, uh, um, of course, uh, Arvind ji mentioned uh, his father's letters and the hockey stick he mentioned. Uh, I was first thinking of focusing only on sports and partition because that has been one of the areas that I've been focusing for last several years. Uh, and particularly when he mentioned hockey, because I had wanted to talk about the film Gold, uh, which was released uh, some years ago. And um, it depicts partition. And I have juxtaposed that with the Bhag Milka Bhag, that how Milka Singh's uh, representation of, uh, or rather in the film, how Milka Singh is represented and how he goes back. But I focused on the sporting event. And that was more, uh, uh, it was full of uh, animosity. And I don't know if in uh, that time uh, in real life, that's how it was. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. But in gold, I found, surprisingly, there was a very a human angle that was depicted uh, when the sporting event takes place. The country has been divided and um, the, two, uh, the two nations are, uh, are meeting so far away from the geography uh, where the players were so familiar uh, with each other. Uh, and the support, the support for each other was evident. So the hockey, the reference to hockey there, uh, I did want to mention that as a, uh, as a brief uh, uh, trajectory. Now moving to Canada, uh, it wasn't that it, partition was anything new for me. I have talked about it previously. We grew up with partition narratives. It wasn't talked about all the time at home. But one knew about it, 1947 partition independence. As a kid, when I was growing up in 70s, partition was still new. Independence was new. Uh, the films that were made, they focused on partition narrative. At least many of the films uh, uh, used to have some reference to, the, to partition, that the father would have uh, arrived in India, or there would be a Baba Ji that, you know, in, during partition, hum se kar thi, phir humne ghar basaya, that we had been uprooted from there, and there being what is now uh, Pakistan. And we have established new roots here. Now, new roots is quite interesting, as we know, that the newer areas in many, many places still are referred to as refugee colonies or camps. Refugee camps, they're still referring to be Jalandhar or Rajpura and so on in Punjab at least. Uh, so that uprooting that was depicted uh, in, uh, in cinema, then the, uh, as I have argued um, several years ago about uh, being surrounded by shop names that were not of the cities from India, like Karachi, Multan, Quetta, like cycle shop or Mithai shop, or even in diaspora, Lahore, Tikka, uh, or there may be Karachi something or the other. So the, these kinds of names, I, I'm of course speaking from my perspective, which is very much the Indian uh, and Indian Punjabi perspective. So that, there would be similar responses possibly from uh, the other side as well. So partition surrounded me. When I came to Canada, I felt that what, what was happening here when I came here in 93? that how did people respond? Did not have any funds or anything, but then could not make a documentary much like many things, uh, many other things. But what I ended up doing was recording testimonies of people who were here, who I knew were here in 1947, one, or those who were much older and would have experienced partition, witnessed partition, uh, in um, the undivided India. Out of those, I learned that in 
in Canada, one, the hesitancy, which I think Nandi has mentioned about, about it also, that hesitancy to speak about it. And Arvindji also mentioned, I think, Sakoon, in your talk also, I found that somewhere or the other, not to talk about it, that silence and so on. So when I had spoken with Naptej Bharti, Punjabi poet in London, Ontario, uh, that why is it that we are not talking about partition? And he said, Ki, maybe silence is the way. Uh, to deal with it and the conversation took place in Punjabi you know okay Indian writers Punjabi writers ne Canada partition why did the Punjabi writers in Canada not talk about partition and his answer was that perhaps they are dealing with it with silence which was very interesting. So on one side, of course, I had been uh, reading and very much immersed in uh, Urvushi Butalia's narrative about the other side of silence, you know, what, what is there on the other side. So here the poet was telling that silence is perhaps one of the ways of dealing with it. And that silence has been uh, uh, shattered quite a lot uh, since my conversation with Nateji took place. There, there have been different writings emerging, but there is much more. I'll still fall back to, uh, I think it was Suvir Call's uh, phrase. It's just like, you know, scratching the surface of the iceberg or something like that. <laughs> uh, and there is so much to talk about. And, and Sukun, as you mentioned, uh, memory of partition, that how memories are triggered. You know, I think it was at 71 war, I think you had mentioned. And um, that um, uh, in Canada, uh, it's no different for people, that how there are various memories, just as the um, pandemic migration, you know, of the heart-wrenching and painful to view through photographs, in news items and so on, that reminded many of us of partition. I read so many comments, oh, that's like partition, that's like partition, and almost colloquial, various kinds of expression and some very profound. Uh, why that is happening again, you know, that whole narrative of post-memory, Marian Hirsch's uh, uh, narrative of post-memory that those of us who have not witnessed or, or experienced, but we in, in a way inherited, inherited from our ancestors or in many cases, as was mentioned at the outside, at outside social memories. So there may be personal memories, there may be uh, family memories, then there are social memories, there are almost like collective memories to some extent, if we look at trains. So in Canada, um, uh, there is the secession of uh, Quebec was quite quite a rampant topic in in ninety five, and then in the nineties we had um, uh, Balkans war. Yugoslavia was disintegrating, and women there was violence against women, which is quite like what happened to women during partition. Uh, and it is uncanny how violence is perpetrated on a woman's body. So that reminder for many of us uh, is, as I argue, I also find in, in uh, artists' work, in creative writers, such as uh, Shauna Singh Baldwin's uh, What the Body Remembers, uh, or uh, Deepa Mehta's Earth, uh, uh, Anita Rao Badami's Can You Hear the Nightbird Call? Uh, and these are further tied with home, that how home is represented, how women's experiences are represented, uh, in what way some of the silences are voiced, are made audible. So this is this is something that uh, that I thought was quite quite interesting to observe. Amongst people in uh, in testimonies, I found, uh, and uh, I previously published work. The name was erroneously written as Asa Singh Johal. It is actually Jack Uppal with whom I had spoken, and he uh, he told me that as a youngster, uh, he along with his Muslim friend used to put posters of down with imperialism in downtown Vancouver and Gastown and other places. And the police used to, you know, and other, they would bring down the posters, but they used to go at night time and put the posters. But 47, when I asked, so how was your relationship? He said, they didn't have any disagreement or anything, but a general drift came 
uh, between the friends. But this is not the norm. So this is just one person's experience. On the other hand, um, we have BBG represented in Anita Rao Badami's novel, who had left India much before partition. And suddenly her home is no longer accessible because it was in Pakistan, her sister is lost and uh, you know there is no trace. So BBG has no home. Uh, as I have argued previously that much like Manoj Kumar uh, uh, talking to Madan Puri's character in Purav or Paschim, uh, that uh, Chacha ji, aap Bharat kyun nahi aate? why don't you come, uncle, why don't you come to India? You know, you haven't come, returned. So Madan Puri's character says that partition occurred and everything was lost in partition. There was no home. So I had no home to return to. So there would be many in diaspora uh, who would have had no home to return to. So the, these representations through literature, particularly and cinema are quite important because they capture those narratives which really have not been paid much attention to. And in the last 30 seconds or so, I would, uh, I would uh, like to um, acknowledge that somewhere someone drew a line I took from Tariq Malik's poem that he had shared with me. And I would like to end with the word yearning, longing, that how there has been yearning and longing in people. Uh, I can think of my mother who died uh, this month, 10 years ago, saying to me, Ke beta tu lahor leke chali, main gafuro nu milke aana. her childhood friend Gafuro, who she longed to meet. So this yearning. So I conclude with the word yearning. Uh, so thank you very much. After listening to all of you, I love the way all of you woven the personal and the fictional. And uh, the wonderful way each of the uh presentation kind of you know carried over from fiction to from in fiction in english to fiction in urdu from fiction published in india to fiction published in the diasporas uh, by women and then uh, with prabhjot we also moved into cinema so i found that very interesting uh, that uh, what Prabhjot said about uh, how these films, even though they are not directly about partition, they reference partition in indirect ways. And when um, Nadi was talking about uh, diasporic fiction, I was actually thinking about diasporic cinema. Uh, for instance, in Monsoon Wedding, that entire conflict arises because of the family sheltering with another family after partition and because the family is beholden to the speedophile, they are unable to confront him because they gave him shelter, they gave the entire tabbar shelter as they call it. So I found that very interesting that you brought in films like uh, Vakt, for instance, where uh, there's that whole partition narrative in the background. But to sum up, what, uh, what I understood from what you all said. First of all, the role of the grandmother. So we have in fiction, in most of the fictional works, we have a BG in uh, Anita Rao Badami, and we have Maji in Sakun's novel, and we have uh, uh, Ismat Chukdai story, which is uh, about roots, but uh, we don't. So we have the third generation or second generation, which is recounting the experience of the first generation who directly witnessed the partition. That was common to all the presentations where the grandmother's character was very important. The second thing, so it's kind of the post memory, how it's passed down to the succeeding generations and how they reconstruct the uh, experience of the direct witnesses of partition. So that was something which connected all the three presentations. The second thing was what Nandi said uh, about how most uh, representations of partition, fictional representations have largely focused on male representations of partition, whereas the women's voices, even though 
uh, women did speak about partition, they have largely been silenced for one other reason. Not only were women's testimonies silenced, but also their fictional representations have not been of the same, uh, they've been disproportionate, one can say, in comparison to the sufferings that the women underwent. So I was thinking about what Nandi said about the nuanced aspect of women's writing and which comes across very nicely in Sakun's novel uh, when I read that. So uh, when Nandi was talking about uh, Ismat Chugtai's Urdu fiction and Alita Rao Godami's English fiction, one of the things I thought was that uh, what uh, Sarah Ansari, uh, not Sarah Ansari, Sarah Suleri said about men live in houses and women live in their bodies. So when one is talking about the fiction also, the kind of details that women's writing focuses on or seizes on, which comes across so beautifully in Sakun's novel and all the other novels which Nandi and Prabhjot talked about, is that aspects which men's novels don't talk about, they come across very beautifully. The nuances of their forms of suffering come across very clearly in women's writing, which male writers are unable to capture. The second um, writer I was reminded of was, you know, when Toni Morrison, the African-American writer writes, somebody said about her writing or about black um, Af American writers writing, they said that uh, when women's writing, I think it was Houston Baker Jogni Jr. who talks about it. And he says that it's like women talking to one another. So mm -hmm. that's a feeling I got when I was reading Sakun's novel. And when I read Anita Rao Badami's novel and Is Ismat Chuktai, and um, not so many films, but many of the novels. It's like the intimate de details, yeah. which males don't focus on. These details came across. They were, uh, they were kind of highlighted by women because women notice these things. So specific details like uh, the, the house, uh, the, the place where Maji hides, uh, you know, that uh, whole, uh, spatial topography of the house and then the finer details. Uh, I thought that was very interesting what Sakun said that these nuances of it being very shameful for a woman to live in her daughter's house which persists mm -hmm. in some homes, traditional Punjabi homes even today that uh, Maji is mortified because she's had to accept her daughter's help, her married daughter's help. So these subtle things are missed in male writing and also the specific ethnic aspects of the writing, which uh, come through in each of these novels uh, are missing in not only in male writing, but when one compares writing from across the regions, for instance, when one is writing Bengali writing, this is not a big deal when one reads Bengali fiction that somebody is dependent on a married daughter, for instance, Meghid Hakatara, the film, uh, it's not a great tragedy that the woman has to start uh, becoming a breadwinner, like a lot of women became breadwinners. But in a pun traditional Punjabi society, there's an, no bigger curse than to have to live off a daughter's, uh, you know, uh, live by the son-in-law. And then finally, I conclude before I request all the speakers to participate in the panel discussion in the order in whichever they want to, as and when they want to speak. And the final part was this whole longing to return, which happens in uh, both uh, when Prabhjot was talking about her mother and when she, when Maji talks about wanting to go back and um, BG doesn't really talk about it, but the thought in the diasporic writing and Indian writing, um, writing from India, I found that diaspora is privileged because one can reconstruct that undivided notion, uh, nation, which BG does in Anita Rao Badami's novel, whereas it can't be done when people are writing, when women are writing about partition in India. It happens in Shona Singh uh, Baldwin's Jassi. It happens in um, 
Anita Rao Badami's novel. And also the second, the layers of partition all over again when she talks about, uh, you know, BG Le through 1984 again. So there are echoes of partition in these novels, some of these novels which recur. So I now request all the panelists to speak in whichever order they'd like to speak. We have about 20, 15 to 20 minutes. This is a great uh, summary you provided. I was thinking as I, if I were having this conversation with Prabhjot, we would say ki Anjali mein bohat achi dekhne di after, uh, you know, uh, after listening to the, and, and just, just the way you synthesized and brought for so many important points. So um, I guess, yeah, you talked about intergenerational memory and how grandmas are really important in uh, many of these texts that are being written by the second or third generation. Um, examples of uh, women being attentive to, you know, the roots and dynamics and uh, really uh, sensitive details that we get on uh, you unnoticed. And just this notion of the longing to return and this, you know, I'm struck by uh, your thought about um, how diasporas can reconstruct or imagine it, the subcontinent as a whole, as opposed to people who are living on the ground reality. And I was, I'm just struck by that because when the pandemic happened, I was in Canada, my parents are in India, and we were having this uh, conversation about, uh, and Prabhu knows this, um, uh, uh, about being able to receive food because my parents are quite elderly and they have to be supplied food to my sister and I asked how is it going and my father said Pura vaga, vaga atari because there was uh, between the two neighborhoods they had closed the gates so my sister could only from uh, you know from the hole between the gates she could pass the food to them so even I was so struck by that reference that that is the first thing he said you know the relationship to the pandemic and to this kind of border that had been generated within the neighborhood was so palpably connected to the partition, uh, which I suppose, you know, perhaps I would not have made that connection because I'm sitting here in Canada. So I think uh, you offered really important insights and I'm very grateful to be part of this panel and to hear Sakoon, I look forward to reading your novel and also to have this conversation with Prabhjot. Uh, thanks, Prabhjot, and you know our conversations are always ongoing. Uh, so, and thanks, Anjali, and you know all the people who are present here. Thank you. Would Prabhjot or Sakun want to add something or respond? Since you just heard my voice, I think Sakun can go ahead, and then I can, <clears throat> then I can. Yeah, I, I'll take it from here. Uh, I think uh, Professor Anjali, I mean, just like uh, Professor Bhatia says, she's succinctly and, uh, you know, she's really derived the essence of this conversation and uh, of all the speakers and the important points, uh, you know, to really theorize it in such a brief way and in such an impressive and uh, solid way. Uh, the one point that I wanted to, uh, you know, uh, delve on, and I've thought about it, is a question as to why uh, Punjabis have not talked so much about partition. Uh, I've thought about it, and perhaps, you know, uh, to see a comparison with the Bengali experience, maybe one would require more empirical evidence, uh, if it's less or more. Uh, but I think uh, the answer to that is, uh, you know, uh, is the answer to this broader question as to why we do not really prefer or uh, uh, put on a pedestal writing as an activity itself, you know, in a cultural way. Because I think we are the people who privilege action always. And I can imagine that generation which is beset with so many problems of rebuilding lives. I think for them, it was anathema to for anybody to be mulling over it for so long. And uh, I know uh, the stares I get and how unproductive uh, writing looks, you know, as such from the outside space and especially in the Punjabi context, you know, <laughs> nothing is happening. 
whereas Punjabis as a people, I think we're always looking for action. You know, my professor at JNU, Professor Kapil Kapoor, always used to offer this anecdote. He says, if you ask Bengalis, what do you do? And, you know, they'll have uh, nouns as answers, you know, that I'm a teacher or I'm a doctor. But if you ask a Punjabi, what do you do? They always have verbs as, as an answer, you know. They <laughs> they <laughs> that was so insightful, you know, as a cultural explanation. I think somewhere we have not really regarded this whole act of writing uh, or, or given it the privilege that uh, one needs to give it, uh, you know, in our experience. So I just wanted to bring that in because whenever I talk about this or think about this, these uh, words of Professor Kapil Kapoor always come to my mind and there indeed could be that cultural uh, explanation for this uh, silence because uh, now it's happening, now it's happening. You know, now somewhere that dialogue is coming up with a force that commonsensically would, should have come somewhere in the past, but now we see it with the force and perhaps, you know, there's an explanation there. And uh, we are also, I think, uh, now in, an, in another historical space. We are now in another cultural space. We are listening more and more to more and more explanation, to more and more different kind of experiences. And we also want to offer our own. So somewhere I think uh, I wanted to bring that in because I've thought about that question quite a bit. And you're right about that. You know, to, to a large extent, what is offered is silence in that generation. And some way, one more thing I want to say is about this lack of bitterness, which uh, I always found in that generation. Despite everything, despite, you know, having uh, suffered so much, suffered firsthand losses. I think I feel more bitter about partition than <laughs> You know, I never got that sense from my grandparents. Yeah. And that's something really amazing, you know, uh, you know, that they continued with that spirit. Maybe it's a larger Punjabi spirit yeah. of moving on, resilience and chardi kala, but it really, really helped them tied over. I mean, I try and imagine myself in that situation. We don't have that element, I feel. We can best talk about it in hindsight, but they actually dealt with it. I think they decided to move on. That's what they say. You know, so, yeah. Absolutely. Really and I think they had, they had their work cut out for them. Yes. And then another thing, like my parents were second generation. Still, you know, their generation also in a way paid a price because... Uh, what, you know, the, that generation lost in terms of lands, in terms of homes, they tried to find that comfort in relatives and the obligation to relatives. Mm -hmm. So my mother always says, you know, that there were these uh, orphan nieces and nephews whose education had to be looked into, whose marrying off had to be looked into. So they, their families were beset with uh, all these obligations and they took it on and they took it on quite spiritedly. But somewhere the parents' generation did pay a little price in terms of uh, lack of resources, in terms of sharing of those resources with extended families. So, uh, and of course, you know, by the time it comes to us, partition was just a word. But I felt that uh, it did have a significance. It, you know, this whole experience which I was borrowing, uh, somewhere you know it had a place in my subjectivity and if i were to create a character from my generation from my this indeed is a very important layer so you know that was the idea i i'm looking forward to reading your novel sakoon haven't had a chance to read it i came to know of it the once it was published so it is amongst the pile of books that I want to read but haven't had a chance. Uh, I would love to read it and then particularly uh, since uh, this whole notion of embroidery was mentioned early on before the session started. I, I wanted to um, talk about, um, you know, as you mentioned that, uh, and Nandi also in, in between mentioned, 
um, people have moved, they moved on or how could, like how they handled it and, you know, not talking about it and, or moving on because there was no other choice, you know, otherwise it is that you are stuck in that trauma um, for, you know, when people say that uh, as a, as a teacher, I have to give disclaimer for everything that I teach that, you know, it includes this, that, and the other, and because there are mm -hmm. people who are very sensitive. So I merely have to give a disclaimer that this text uh, uh, focuses on violence, communal strife or ethnic strife and so on. So if, <laughs> so it is unimaginable for us uh, that what that generation went through, those who experienced partition, uh, because currently it is even the reference can be tra so traumatizing that uh, a disclaimer has to be given. Uh, I, I, rem I remembered uh, someone saying to me, this is I think 93 when I was collecting some testimonies here. And, uh, and I met the, uh, that lady just about a year ago and we were talking about that and I'm sure she's probably more ready to talk about it now. And she said to me, when I ask you to see partition the time, uh, where were you during the time of partition? And she said, why do you want to ask? And the way she said was very nicely, very softly. Then she did share with me a bit of her experience and where, you know, the father took two sisters outside the village under a tree to, uh, with a sword to cut their uh, necks off. But father did not have the courage. And I'm so glad. <laughs> and I, I think that was a brave thing not to have shown courage at that time. And the daughter survived. So, so that is a major trauma for, for her. So to talk about it also is not easy. So, you know, that whole thing, what is on the other side of silence, those various traumas, those voices that we don't hear and so on. So moving on, uh, I suppose. And um, the other thing was... Um, I wanted to mention was through literary voices, uh, poetry, I mentioned about the title, but I had wanted to talk about poems because I have talked about some poems previously also, be it Gulzar's Zero Line or Mazhar um, Tirmzi's Umra Langiya Pabampar or A Lifetime on Tiptoes and how these capture those emotions just by reading, you know, uh, as I talked about longing and yearning, I also talk about that those of us who, those of us who are invested in partition, it, it is a painful, painful uh, exercise, if I can call it, or living. Uh, it's part of life. I don't have to purposely go and search for it. It's very much part of it, as Nandi was sharing about, uh, you know, uh, uh, her father and sister meeting at what looked like Vaga Atari border. Vaga Atari, Vaga border has become like a metaphor, isn't it? That metaphor. anywhere we see barbed wires or really monitored situation, then one ends up saying it is almost like Vaga border without realizing what all it entails. Uh, so that uh, that reference, I think, is so powerful that it is never away from our mindset. Uh, and um, I, I, also, uh, I also wanted to, uh, through the, this whole notion of line, uh, take you to Intazar Hussain's uh, Udas Nasle. Uh, yeah. I haven't focused much on women's writing. I could talk about Shauna Singh Baldwin's novel, which I absolutely love. And you know where she talks about the train and beehive and so on. But I will go to Intazar Hussain's uh, Udas Nasle, where uh, you know the caravan that few people and then about a thousand or so have joined. And he talks about it like a python. So for me, python is also the snake imagery is also a line, you know, that meandering. And then he talks about that, you know, how how in certain portions it was sort of ballooned. I forget the exact word that he has used. Uh, so how these lines manifest, Radcliffe line as it's sort of the crooked line, you know, as it goes, um, or as it is depicted on the map. And then that crooked line, how it is depicted when we physically go to the border side, those of us who have gone to 
Vaga border or Dera Baba Nanak or close by, we can see the barbed wire. Barbed wire is not like, you know, every line is not crooked. Barbed wire is stretched straight between two poles and how that line, there's a long line. And from the aircraft, I remember first time when I returned to India in December 94, I've never forgotten that experience from the, the, the pilot announced that we were over Lahore, you know, and I was so thrilled that, hey, Lahore, achha, we've never been, uh, Lahore, chalo, asman chui dekh lea, Lahore, badi khushi hoi type, you know, it was night time, and the border was so clear, and since I'm deeply invested in maps and boundaries, uh, I felt at that time that this is what I am seeing. So, uh, so these references of lines, when I see depicted in poems or novels, you know, uh, or through the movement of people or through the description of borders, or when that border is cut through a film came uh, Mangoes in Monsoon or Monsoon Mangoes, I just forget, where, you know, much like the meeting of separated brothers. We have seen brother and sister or separated brothers on YouTube, all those ground level people who are trying to unite Bichdehue families, the separated siblings. Uh, so in that film, uh, the sibling from India, he travels in an auto rickshaw all the way to the border. And then his, his brother comes to meet him at the border. And he, of course, the unthinkable happens of course wishful thinking where the uh, where the brother from the indian side is able to go to the other side of the border which i thought was very interesting because this is what i find reflected in gulzar's poem that uh, at the zero line his father's ghost receives him he sees him and, and he says father says that, that you know when i died i came here so this is the home and there is almost a reference that that's where he would be going to. Uh, so I thought that that brother crossing the border and going into Pakistan was quite interesting because that is home for him. But for women, we hardly see such representations. Thanks, Prabh Chok. Uh, I was also thinking about uh, Sakun talking about Urdu. And Nandi also brought in Urdu writing. So I think, Sakun, we have an answer for you. Probably and Nandi and Prabhichot have an answer for you because uh, the language which was used before partition uh, was Urdu, written in the Shamukhi script, which the Punjabi University Patiala is doing a lot of work on in the mutual translation between Urdu Gurmukhi and Devanagari script. Uh, now we can understand each other's writing thanks to the work that Punjabi University Patiala is doing. But the language was a shared, the script was shared and all male who had to enter the workplace, the males had to learn Urdu. They were, they, they were taught Urdu, whereas the females uh, depending on whether they were Hindu or Sikh, who are made to learn Devanagari or Gurmukhi. So I suppose that's the answer you were looking for. Now in the next couple of minutes, before we conclude, I would request Dr. Gurmukh Singh and Dr. Taramjeet Singh to have, to, to have their say, because I'm sure they have something to say about Punjabi literature, which we've been talking about. Professor Gurmukh Singh has done wonderful work on Punjab Punjabi literature. And Taramjeet works, he st stands between both English and Punjabi. So I'd like both of you to make an intervention before we give the word of thanks. Uh, ਸਾਡੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਤਿੰਨੇ ਸਪੀਕਰ ਸੀ ਉਹ ਬਹੁਤ ਲਾਇਕ ਸੀ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਸੁਣਨਾ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀਆਂ ਗੱਲਾਂ ਬਹੁਤ ਹੀ ਦਿਲ ਨੂੰ ਧੂਪ ਪਾਉਣ ਵਾਲੀਆਂ ਸੀ ਤੇ ਫਿਰ ਅੰਜਲੀ ਕੀ ਦਾ ਰੋਇ ਮੈਡਮ ਨੇ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਗੱਲਾਂ ਕੀਤੀਆਂ ਉਹ ਵੀ ਸੁਣਦੇ ਹੋਇਆ ਮੇਰੇ ਮਨ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇੱਕ ਵਿਚਾਰ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਲਗਾਤਾਰ ਆਉਂਦਾ ਰਿਹਾ ਉਹ ਇੱਕ ਪਾਰਟੀਸ਼ਨ ਇਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਦਾ ਸਮਾਂ ਸੀ ਜਿਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਅਬਸਰਡਿਟੀ ਸੀ ਜਿਵੇਂ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਸਕੂਨ ਸਿੰਘ ਹੋਰਾ ਨੇ ਕਿਹਾ ਤੇ ਵਾਇਲੈਂਸ ਸੀ ਤੇ ਜਦੋਂ ਅਸੀਂ ਉਹਦੀਆਂ ਲਿਟਰੇਰੀ ਰਿਪਰੈਜ਼ੈਂਟੇਸ਼ਨਸ ਨੇ ਜਾਂ ਸਿਨੇ
ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਅੰਤ ਨੂੰ ਹੋਪ ਡੋਮੀਨੇਟ ਕਰ ਜਾਂਦੀ ਹੈ ਗੁੱਡਨੈਸ ਡੋਮੀਨੇਟ ਕਰ ਜਾਂਦੀ ਹੈ ਜਦੋਂ ਗੁੱਡਨੈਸ ਜਾਂ ਹੋਪ ਡੋਮੀਨੇਟ ਕਰਦੀ ਆ ਤਾਂ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਵਾਇਲੈਂਸ ਆ ਜਾਂ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਈਵਲ ਆ ਉਹਦੀ ਅੰਡਰਸਟੈਂਡਿੰਗ ਕਿਤੇ ਪਿੱਛੇ ਰਹਿ ਜਾਂਦੀ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਸ਼ੁਰੂਆਤ ਇਸ ਤੋਂ ਕਰਦੇ ਆ ਕਿ ਈਵਲ ਕੀ ਆ ਵਾਇਲੈਂਸ ਕੀ ਆ ਪਰ ਜਦੋਂ ਐਂਡ ਤੱਕ ਪਹੁੰਚਦੇ ਆ ਕਿਸੇ ਵੀ ਲਿਟਰੇਰੀ ਜਾਂ ਸਿਨੇਮੈਟਿਕ ਰਿਪਰੈਜ਼ੈਂਟੇਸ਼ਨ ਦਾ ਹੋਪ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਕਨਵਰਟ ਹੋ ਜਾਂਦੀ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਹੋਪ ਚਾਹੀਦੀ ਹੈ ਇਹ ਗੱਲ ਹੈ ਵੀ ਠੀਕ ਕਿ ਹੋਪ ਤੋਂ ਬਿਨਾ ਹਿਊਮਨ ਲਾਈਫ ਦਾ ਐਗਜ਼ਿਸਟ ਕਰਨਾ ਔਖਾ ਪਰ ਫਿਰ ਇਹ ਨਾਲ ਹੀ ਖਤਰਾ ਬਣਿਆ ਹੋਇਆ ਕਿ ਹੋਪ ਦੇ ਕਾਰਨ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਉਹ ਸਮਾਂ ਸੀ ਉਹ ਹੋਪ ਦੇ ਕਾਰਨ ਸਮਝਿਆ ਨਹੀਂ ਜਾ ਸਕਦਾ ਪੂਰਾ ਕਿ ਇਹ ਇੱਕ ਦਵੰਦ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਇਹ ਡੁਅਲਿਟੀ ਹੈ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਜਾਂ ਇਹ ਇੱਕ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਦਾ ਇਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਪ੍ਰੋਸੈਸ ਬਣਿਆ ਰਹਿੰਦਾ ਕਿ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਸਮਝਣ ਦੀ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਕਰਦੇ ਹੋ ਫਿਰ ਹੋਪ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਕਨਵਰਟ ਕਰ ਦਿੰਦੇ ਹੋ ਚੋਂ ਹੀ ਹੋਪ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਕਨਵਰਟ ਕਰਦੇ ਹੋ ਉਹ ਸਮਾਂ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਉਹ ਪਕੜ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚੋਂ ਬਾਹਰ ਹੋ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਇਹਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਹੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਗੱਲ ਮੈਂ ਇੱਕ ਹੋਰ ਮਹਿਸੂਸ ਕਰਦਾ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਇਹਦੇ ਬਾਰੇ ਕਮੈਂਟ ਵੀ ਕਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਹੋ ਪਹਿਲੀ ਗੱਲ ਬਾਰੇ ਵੀ ਕਿ ਉਹ ਇਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਦਾ ਸਮਾਂ ਸੀ ਜਿਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਸਾਡੀ ਫਿਤਰਤ ਦਾ ਮੀਨਿੰਗ ਲੱਭਣ ਦੀ ਕਿ ਚਾਹੇ ਕੋਈ ਵੀ ਨੈਰੇਟਿਵ ਹੋਵੇ ਚਾਹੇ ਸਿਨੇਮੈਟਿਕ ਹੋਵੇ ਜਾਂ ਲਿਟਰੇਰੀ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਮੀਨਿੰਗ ਦੇਣ ਦੀ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਕੀਤੀ ਜਾਂਦੀ ਹੈ ਤੇ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਟਾਈਮ ਸੀ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਚੀਜ਼ਾਂ ਇਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਨਹੀਂ ਸੀ ਕਿ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਅਰਥ ਲੱਭੇ ਜਾ ਸਕਣ ਮੀਨਿੰਗ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਜਾ ਸਕੇ ਵੀ ਬੰਦਾ ਇਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਕਿਉਂ ਹੋ ਗਿਆ ਇਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਕਿਉਂ ਕੀਤਾ ਕੁਝ ਅਹਿਸਾਸ ਜਦੋਂ ਉੱਥੇ ਹੰਡਾਏ ਉਸ ਵੇਲੇ ਦੇ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਨੇ ਉਹ ਇਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਕਿਉਂ ਸੀ ਤਾਂ ਜਦ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਚੀਜ਼ ਮੀਨਿੰਗ ਤੋਂ ਪਾਰ ਆ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਮੀਨਿੰਗ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਬੰਨੀ ਨਹੀਂ ਜਾ ਸਕਦੀ ਹੈਗੀ ਜਦੋਂ ਅਸੀਂ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਮੀਨਿੰਗ ਦੇਣ ਦੀ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਕਰਦੇ ਆ ਉਦੋਂ ਵੀ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਲੱਗਦਾ ਕਿ ਇਹ ਆਪਦੇ ਆਪ ਚ ਇੱਕ ਅੜਚਨ ਬਣ ਜਾਂਦੀ ਹੈ ਜਿਹਦੇ ਕਰਕੇ ਪਾਰਟੀਸ਼ਨ ਬਾਰੇ ਘੱਟ ਬੋਲਿਆ ਗਿਆ ਕਿ ਉਸ ਸਮੇਂ ਨੂੰ ਮੀਨਿੰਗ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਬੰਨਣਾ ਔਖਾ ਤੇ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਬੰਨਣਾ ਔਖਾ ਇਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਉਹਦੇ ਬਾਰੇ ਚੁੱਪ ਬਟ ਲਈ ਜਾ ਚੁੱਪ ਕੀਤਾ ਜਾਵੇ ਤਾਂ ਇਹ ਵੀ ਇੱਕ ਪ੍ਰੋਬਲਮ ਰਹੀ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਸਮਿਆਂ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਬਹੁਤ ਅਸਾਧਾਰਨ ਸਮੇਂ ਸੀ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਸਮੇਂ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਸਧਾਰਨ ਸਮਿਆਂ ਦੀ ਭਾਸ਼ਾ ਨਾਲ ਕਹਿਣ ਦੀ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਕਰਦੇ ਆ ਜਾਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਅਸਧਾਰਨ ਸਮਿਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਸਧਾਰਨ ਸਮਿਆਂ ਦੀ ਪੂਰੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਸਿੰਬਲ ਸਿੰਬੋਲਿਕ ਵਰਲਡ ਆ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਬੰਨਣ ਦੀ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਕਰਦੇ ਆ ਤਾਂ ਇਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਵੀ ਔਖ ਮੁਸ਼ਕਲ ਰਹਿੰਦੀ ਆ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਪਾਰਟੀਸ਼ਨ ਬਾਰੇ ਗੱਲ ਕੱਟ ਕੀਤੀ ਆ ਤੇ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਅੰਜਲੀ ਮੈਮ ਨੇ ਗੱਲ ਕਹੀ ਸੀ ਕਿ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਵਿੱਚ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਬਹੁਤ ਖੂਬਸੂਰਤ ਕਹਾਣੀਆਂ ਹੁਣ ਜਿਵੇਂ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਸਕੂਨ ਹੋਰਾਂ ਨੇ ਵੀ ਗੱਲ ਕੀਤੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਥਰਡ ਜਨਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਆ ਉਹ ਬਹੁਤ ਖੂਬਸੂਰਤ ਕਹਾਣੀਆਂ ਲਿਖ ਰਹੀ ਆ ਚਾਹੇ ਉਹ ਸਾਮਲਤਾ ਮੀਡੀਆ ਕਹਾਣੀਆਂ ਜਾਂ ਹੋਰ ਰਾਈਟਰਸ ਨੇ ਜੇ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਮੌਕਾ ਲੱਗੇ ਤਾਂ ਜ਼ਰੂਰ ਪੜਿਓ ਬਹੁਤ ਹੀ ਸ਼ਾਨਦਾਰ ਕਹਾਣੀਆਂ ਨੇ ਇਸੇ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਪ੍ਰਭਜੋਤ ਹੋਰਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਮੈਂ ਸ਼ੇਅਰ ਕਰਨਾ ਚਾਹੂੰਗਾ ਕਿ ਹੁਣ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਸਿਨੇਮਾ ਬਣ ਰਿਹਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਬਿਲਕੁਲ ਨਵਾਂ ਸਿਨੇਮਾ ਜਿਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਸਮਝ ਲਓ ਕਿ ਫੋਰਥ ਜਨਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਸਿਨੇਮਾ ਬਣਾ ਰਹੀ ਹੈ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਪਾਰਟੀਸ਼ਨ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਇੱਕ ਵਾਰ ਫਿਰ ਹੋਣੀ ਸ਼ੁਰੂ ਹੋਈ ਆ ਮੈਂ ਜੇ ਐਗਜ਼ਾਮਪਲ ਦਵਾਂ ਤਾਂ ਫਿਲਮ ਆਈ ਸੀ ਇੱਕ ਲਾਹੌਰੀਏ ਤੇ ਜੇ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਦੇਖੋ ਤਾਂ ਬਹੁਤ ਹੀ ਬਖਰੇ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਉਹਦੇ 
ਕਿ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਸਮਿਆਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਜੈਂਡਰ ਦੀ ਰਿਜਿਡ ਬੰਡ ਸੀ ਕਿ ਬੰਦਾ ਇਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਹੋਣਾ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਤੇ ਔਰਤ ਇਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਹੋਣੀ ਚਾਹੀਦੀ ਉਹ ਸਮੇਂ ਇਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਦੇ ਸੀ ਕਿ ਬੰਦੇ ਤੋਂ ਉਹਦਾ ਮਰਦਾਮਾਪਣ ਖੋ ਲਿਆ ਸੀ ਤੇ ਔਰਤ ਨੂੰ ਹੋਰ ਬਹੁਤ ਸਾਰੇ ਇਸ਼ੂਜ਼ ਦੇ ਸਾਹਮਣੇ ਕਰਦਾ ਸੀ ਜਿਵੇਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਨਾਵਲ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਹੀ ਇੱਕ ਕਰੈਕਟਰ ਆ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਸਪਾਈ ਵੀ ਆ ਤੇ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਕਢਾਈ ਵੀ ਕਰਦਾ ਤੇ ਉਹਦਾ ਇੱਕ ਸੈਂਸਿਟਿਵ ਪੱਖ ਵੀ ਆ ਤੇ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਦੂਜਾ ਉਹਦਾ ਇੱਕ ਲੰਡ ਵਾਲਾ ਪੱਖ ਵੀ ਆ ਤਾਂ ਇਹ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਨਾਵਲ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਵੀ ਆਉਂਦਾ ਕਿ ਜੈਂਡਰ ਫਲੂਇਡਿਟੀ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਕਿਵੇਂ ਪਾਰਟੀਸ਼ਨ ਨੇ ਸਿਖਾਈ ਆ ਤੇ ਅੰਤ ਵਿੱਚ ਮੈਂ ਆਖਰੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਗੱਲ ਆ ਹੋ ਕੇ ਜਦੋਂ ਅਸੀਂ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਇੱਕ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਦਾ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਨੂੰ ਸਮਝਣ ਲਈ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਸਕੂਨ ਸਿੰਘ ਦਾ ਨਾਵਲ ਕੇ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਕੰਟੈਂਪਰਰੀ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਆ ਉਹ ਕਿਸ ਤਰੀਕੇ ਦਾ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਨਸ਼ੇ ਵੀ ਨੇ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਹੋਰ ਬਹੁਤ ਸਾਰੀਆਂ ਪ੍ਰੋਬਲਮਸ ਨੇ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਪਾਰਟੀਸ਼ਨ ਦੀ ਤੰਦ ਵੀ ਆ ਜਾਂਦੀ ਆ ਤੇ ਅੰਤ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਸਕੂਨ ਹੋਰੀ ਵੀ ਇਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਦੀ ਚੀਜ਼ ਪੇਸ਼ ਕਰਦੇ ਆ ਕਿ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਫਿਰ ਫਾਈਟ ਕਰ ਰਿਹਾ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਦੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਚੀਜ਼ ਆ ਹੁਣ ਫਾਈਟ ਬਾਹਰ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੈਗੀ ਬਹੁਤ ਲੰਮਾ ਸਮਾਂ ਬਾਹਰੋਂ ਫਾਈਟ ਕਰਦਾ ਰਿਹਾ ਬਾਹਰਲੇ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਲੜਦਾ ਰਿਹਾ ਬਾਹਰਲੇ ਇਨਵੇਡਰਸ ਨਾਲ ਲੜਦਾ ਹੁਣ ਇਹਦੀ ਅੰਦਰਲੀ ਫਾਈਟ ਆ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਉਹ ਕਰ ਰਿਹਾ ਉਹ ਵੀ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਹੋਪ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਹੀ ਨਿਵੇੜਦੇ ਪਰ ਪਤਾ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਿ ਹੋਪ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਨਿਵੇੜਨਾ ਹੁਣ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਨੂੰ ਸਮਝਣ ਲਈ ਕਿੰਨਾ ਕੁ ਠੀਕ ਬੈਠੂਗਾ ਇੰਨੇ ਕੁ ਮੈਂ ਕਮੈਂਟ ਕਰਨੇ ਸੀ ਜੀ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਗੁਰਮੁਖ ਸਿੰਘ ਜੀ ਸੋ ਨਾਈਸਲੀ ਪੁੱਟ ਔਰ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਸ਼ੇਅਰ ਕੀਤਾ ਬਹੁਤ ਹੀ ਅੱਛਾ ਔਰ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਹੋਪ ਦੀ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਗੱਲ ਕਹੀ ਸੀ ਨਾ ਉਹਦੇ ਤੋਂ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਇੱਕਦਮ ਇਮੇਜਰੀ ਯਾਦ ਆ ਗਈ ਸ਼ੋਨਾ ਸਿੰਘ ਬੋਲਵਿਨ ਦੀ ਨੋਵਲ ਚਾ ਇਨ ਫੈਕਟ ਉਹ ਮੈਂ ਆਪਣੇ ਚੈਪਟਰ ਦਾ ਟਾਈਟਲ ਯੂਜ਼ ਕੀਤਾ ਸੀ ਉਹ ਸੀ ਮੂਵਿੰਗ ਫਾਰਵਰਡ ਦੋ ਸਟਿਲ ਫੇਸਿੰਗ ਬੈਕ ਉਹ ਟਾਂਗੇ ਚ ਬੈਠੇ ਹੁੰਦੇ ਉੱਜੜ ਕੇ ਆਏ ਨੇ ਦਿੱਲੀ ਐ ਨਾ ਅਮੀਰ ਬੰਦਾ ਸੀਗਾ ਐਨੀ ਸ਼ਾਨਦਾਰ ਗੱਡੀਆਂ ਚ ਬੈਠਦਾ ਸੀ ਤਾਂ ਹੁਣ ਉਹ ਨਾ ਟਾਂਗੇ ਚ ਬੈਠ ਕੇ ਜਾ ਰਿਹਾ ਤੇ ਟਾਂਗੇ ਜਦ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਪਿੱਛੇ ਬੈਠਦੇ ਹੋ ਟਾਂਗਾ ਤਾਂ ਅੱਗੇ ਜਾ ਰਿਹਾ ਲੇਕਿਨ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਪਿੱਛੇ ਦੇਖ ਰਹੇ ਹੋ ਉਹ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਇੰਨਾ ਅੱਛਾ ਮੈਟਾਫਰ ਲੱਗਿਆ ਸੀਗਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਮੂਵਿੰਗ ਫਾਰਵਰਡ ਦੋ ਸਟਿਲ ਲੁਕਿੰਗ ਬੈਕ ਜਿੱਦਾਂ ਅਸੀਂ ਬੱਸ ਜਾਂ ਟ੍ਰੇਨ ਚ ਵੀ ਕਰਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਕਈਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਪਸੰਦ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਹੈ ਇਧਰਲੀ ਖਿੜਕੀ ਤੇ ਬੈਠਾ ਤਾਂ ਕਿ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਪਿਛਲਾ ਦਿਖੇ ਕਈ ਅੱਗੇ ਦੇਖਣਾ ਮੰਗਦੇ ਆ ਸੋ ਉਹ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਸੈਂਸ ਆਫ ਹੋਪ ਹੈ ਆਈ ਵਾਸ ਥਿੰਕਿੰਗ ਕਿ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਮੈਂ ਉਸ ਤਰੀਕੇ ਨਾਲ ਵੀ ਇੰਟਰਪ੍ਰੇਟ ਕਰ ਸਕਦੀ ਹਾਂ ਕਿ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਹੋਪ ਉਹ ਬੜੀ ਅੱਛੀ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਡਿਪਿਕਟ ਕੀਤੀ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਹੋਪ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਆ ਕੇ ਛੱਡਿਆ ਨਹੀਂ ਸਭ ਕੁਝ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਸੋ ਮੱਚ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਸੋ ਮੱਚ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਬਾਕੀ ਦੱਸਿਆ ਕਿ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਚ ਵੀ ਹੁਣ ਕੰਮ ਹੋ ਰਿਹਾ ਅੱਛਾ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਦੀਆਂ ਕਹਾਣੀਆਂ ਤੇ ਪੜੀਆਂ ਹੋਈਆਂ ਬਟ ਹੁਣ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਨਵਾਂ ਕੰਮ ਆ ਰਿਹਾ ਉਹ ਇੰਨਾ ਜ਼ਿਆਦਾ ਨਹੀਂ ਪੜਿਆ ਹੋਇਆ ਮੈਂ ਤੁਹਾਡੇ ਨਾਲ ਸ਼ੇਅਰ ਕਰਾਂ ਜਿਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਨਾ ਗੁਰਦੁਆਰੇ ਚ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਵਕਤ ਦੀ ਕਮੀ ਹੋਣ ਦੇ ਕਾਰਨ ਸਾਧ ਸੰਗਤ ਜੀ ਉਹ ਸਾਬ ਸਾਡਾ ਹੈ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਪੜਾਉਂਦੇ ਨੇ ਵਕਤ ਦੀ ਕਮੀ ਨੂੰ ਦੇ ਪਰ ਉਹ ਬਹਾਨਾ ਵੀ ਹੋ ਸਕਦਾ ਹੈ ਨਾ ਸੋ ਬਟ ਜ਼ਰੂਰ ਸ਼ੇਅਰ ਕਰਨਾ ਪਲੀਜ਼ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਤਰਨਜੀਤ ਵੀ ਵਾਂਟ ਟੂ ਹੀਅਰ ਯੂ ਐਸ ਵੈਲ ਮੈਮ ਆਈ ਡੋਨਟ ਥਿੰਕ ਥੈਟ ਆਈ ਵੁੱਡ ਹੈਵ ਐਨੀਥਿੰਗ ਸਬਸਟੈਂਸ਼ਲ ਟੂ ਐਡ ਟੂ ਆਫਟਰ ਵਾਟ ਐਵਰ ਹੈਜ਼ ਬੀਨ ਸੈਡ and uh, i would uh, like to take some time to
unfolding of the process because they constitute 50% of humanity. So how is it possible? So I'm really curious to understand whether whether we have such, uh, whether we, you people have come across such uh, incidents where women were the perpetrators. Amrit, I would uh, right off the bat, it's, it's a very good point. Um, I don't have any statistics uh, as such, but from literary point of view, I remember two stories. So sorry, I don't remember their titles, but I'll go through my uh, notes and so on uh, in the Baksa, because that's where it is sitting, I know. Where um, uh, women were complicit in uh, selling uh, women who had been abducted. Right. So, um, for instance, uh, not only that, but also rejecting uh, the daughter or the daughter-in-law of the family, particularly daughter-in-law of the family. Uh, and this would be in the case of, uh, say, Hindu women mostly, uh, that uh, when the a uh, young girl or young woman was, or maybe even older, was brought back home, uh, she was outrightly rejected. So that is a violence also that takes place. Right. And uh, Ramanan Sagar has done a splendid job. I think one of the stories I remember uh, has Raman, is written by Na Ramanan Sagar, but I, I don't want to say with authority. So you will find some uh, short stories like that and partly in novels as well, you will find Pinjar also has some reference and cinema also does that. Sorry, Nandi also has something to say. So, uh, but I think largely one must keep in mind that it, that violence was perpetrated by men. I must, I do want to highlight that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I just wanted to add that there are certain ways in which women writers also address the issue. So, uh, Baksi Sigma Striking India, for example, which is so populated by female characters, you know, and Godmother is a very strong character, and Lenny, her granddaughter, eight year old Lenny, is telling the story. But there are uh, issues of uh, power relationships that come about. So, uh, her mother and godmother are these uh, empowered middle class women who actually rescue them and they also rescue Aya. But all, but they are not able to save her when they actually come to, uh, you know, that is something that always bothered me about the novel, that when the mob comes to take, uh, and they, they knew these people, they come to take away Aya, why can't these women stop that? Because they are so empowered. But of course, you know, Power also gets displaced at times of crisis. So anyway, there are moments like that that one encounters um, in the novel, just just to uh, in ways that captures the kind of complexity of uh, class power, caste power, you know, things like that. So not all. I mean, there are men like uh, the gardener Hari, for example, you know, or or poor men who are really disempowered during partition and the upper class women have more more power over them. Yeah. Right. So thank you for the question. Yeah. Ma'am, can I take half a second? Yes, please. <laughs> I'm tempted to respond to Gurmukh Singh Ji's point on hope. You know, he says your novel ends on hope. And if that is, you know, the right way now to look at Punjab and if we are in uh, times when hope is not enough, I just want to say if not hope, then what? And uh, secondly, uh, if you look at the politics of art in this novel, there is this whole politics of art also unfolding. How do you appreciate art? You know, how there is this level where there's something spurious that's happening and Nanki's out to challenge that. And Nanki has her own notions of what is good art and how she's not uh, uh, supported by the academy. That, in a way, uh, is uh, at a micro level, uh, you know, the uh, situation uh, unfolding in Punjab at a state level. I felt that what is happening at the college level in the novel is what is happening at state level in Punjab. And uh, Nanki goes back to her Sufi uh, ethos, uh, her rooting in Gurbani to look at and analyze these things. So somewhere... Uh, I was thinking of a solution and thinking of us going back to some of those notions and uh, reviewing and viewing uh, the rot today. 
I don't know if I have answers. I don't know if I have solution. <laughs> uh, but uh, that was my little way to look at what's going on in the larger picture and uh, how if we're able to recognize what is good about ourselves also, if we're able to powerfully do that, to recognize what is good about Punjab, because somewhere the embroidery is actually emanating out Fulkari. But he's doing things with Fulkari also. Fulkari we jari hagi hai, we ek stereotype ban gaya. Te us cheez nu vi ho challenge kar gaya hai. Kyunki agar eda cover dekho ge, novel da, te men nu kya kya gaya se dete Fulkari lagani hai, te men kya ni Fulkari ni lagani. Oh hi stereotype men ni karna chandhi perpetuate, kyunki jada Juginder Singh ya Fulkari nu toda agge lakke ja raha hai. Ode jada influences hai, o global ho rahe hai. So somewhere I think that Punjab is a dialogue that is stagnant. It is a kickstart. It is a dialogue. 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 Have stopped in uh, Sakun's title. The songs have fled the songs that have stopped. And then we move to women uh, writing partition. And uh, somewhere someone drew a line in Pub Jodh. Three different takes on partition, but I love uh, they kind of welded into one another. And I love the way you all spoke to each other, even though you hadn't consulted each other in advance. And I love the way we move from Punjabi to Urdu to English, from India to diaspora. So with that, uh, unfortunately, we have to bring this panel to an end, this discussion to an end. I request Dr. Taramjeet Singh to give a vote of thanks. Thanks, ma'am. So it has already been more than 90 plus minutes. Yes. So. I would uh, like to propose the vote of thanks. I'll start with our panelists. So I thank uh, Dr. Sukun Singh Ji, Professor Nandi Bhatia Ji, and Professor Prabhjot Parmar Ji for sparing the time to be with us and making this event an enriching experience. I also thank uh, Professor Arvind, uh, Vice Chancellor of Punjab University Patiala for uh, sparing his time and for always encouraging our efforts and supporting us with everything. I thank Professor Anjali Gera Royji for organizing the present discussion. I thank Professor Gurmukh Singh Ji, Director, Center for Diaspora Studies, for his continuous support. Finally, I would like to thank everyone whose hard work has made this discussion possible. Thanks, everyone.